All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the sixth, I believe, Timothy A. Johnson Medical Scholar Seminar um, for this academic year. As many of you are aware, this seminar series is named in honor of our first Dean for Research here at VTCSOM, Timothy Johnson, and he was very passionate about the idea of combining the, sort of the graduate level um, focus on biomedical research with medical student curriculum. And so that's where this seminar series came from. Um, today I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Timothy A. Pollock, who is here from Ohio State. Uh, where he is currently serving as chair of surgery. Uh, part, <laughs> yes, we, we have a lot of connections to Ohio State. May, many of you may remember Dr. Jennifer Vaughn. That, that's where she is now, so shout out to Dr. Vaughn. Um, I know. So Dr. Pollock got his, his bachelor's degree from Georgetown, and then he went on to top. <laughs> this is a different introduction this time. <laughs> Let's see. Anybody from Tufts? <laughs> Jumbo. Jumbo. <laughs> so Dr. Dr. Pollock got his MD and his MPH from Tufts, and then he went on to get. Um, he went on to do his residency at University of Michigan, and he also did a degree in, in Harvard School of Divinity in bioethics. So a master's degree um, focused on bioethics. Um, he did a fellowship, uh, a surgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson, and then when, when, he went, when he moved to Johns Hopkins to start his career, he also entered a PhD program to build up his, his clinical research skills. So it's a very interesting path of training to give him the skills that have allowed him to be enormously productive. So the first hundred pages of his CV are his publications. So, and it's in a vast array of research into um, a lot on this particular topic, but ranging um, all the way from basic science, which is some of the work he did, some lab work early on, um, to epidemiology. And some of you are familiar with health system science, which is where our school is, is looking at heading. So, so a lot of his publications are looking at the impact of various aspects of the health system on surgical outcomes. So. His research and his research interests span a, a wide variety of topics. Um, so in, in 2016, he left John, in 2016, he left Johns Hopkins to become chair of surgery there. Um, and when he was nominated for this seminar series by, doc, by our own Dr. David Limbazi, and when Dr. Limbazi nominated him, he was very excited when he heard he would be coming here because he, he feels that um, Dr. Pollock has really shaped our thinking regarding uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma um, for the past decade. So I know that the Department of Surgery was excited to host him for um, Grand Rounds this morning, and we are very excited to, to hear his seminar this afternoon. So thank you, Dr. Pollock. So, so thank you very much for that uh, warm uh, introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been having a wonderful uh, visit, my first time here in uh, Roanoke um, and at uh, Virginia Tech uh, Kerlin School of Medicine. So I really want to thank all of you and a wonderful lunch with some of the students and uh, appreciate that. So um, I'm going to talk to you about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. It's a somewhat niche esoteric topic for many of you um, because it is a relatively rare disease. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit ab about this, one, because um, I'm kind of a liver geek and um, this is a disease that I really love uh, talking about. The second reason is that I wanted to use it as an example of you know, how I very purposely picked a disease and an area to focus on um, when I was a fellow and kind of said, this is what I want to do for the next 10 years. Um, and then tried to very purposely build a career and research trajectory around this topic and try to contribute to the field around intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And I picked intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma in part because um, I'm an HPB surgeon and, and uh, hepatopancreatic biliary surgeon and this is a liver tumor. Um, but then I also picked it because I knew it was an understudied and rare disease. There had been a lot of work done in colorectal liver metastasis is about like 10, 15 years ago. A lot of work done in gallbladder and in primary hepatocellular carcinoma. 
But if you looked in the literature, there was a paucity of data and publications around this topic. So I kind of thought, hmm, this is somewhere that I can go, not going to be a threat to my mentors who are working in this other space, draft off what they've been doing in these other diseases and apply it to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And then ultimately, which I think we all hope to do, whether we're PhDs or MDs, make a contribution to the field and actually impact the lives of patients. So um, I'm going to um, talk about a number of things today. Um, I had the privilege of being on the um, International Liver Cancer Association um, guidelines for the practice of practice guidelines for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and this was a kind of international a group that was charged by ILCA to um, come up with practice guidelines based on um, uh, evidence uh, in the literature. And the things that we uh, tackled uh, are these uh, topics here around epidemiology, molecular pathogenesis, staging, treatment, and then future directions. So I'm going to talk about each one of these a little bit in uh, turn. So we talked about this at lunch a little bit with some of the students about how there's um, immense geographic variation in the incidence of um, cholangiocarcinoma throughout the world. Um, if you look at the United States, the incidence is about one to two per 100,000. And I was mentioning that I was recently in Bangkok and talking to the uh, health minister there. And in northeast uh, uh, Thailand, northern part of Thailand, you can see that cholangiocarcinoma is epidemic, 85 per 100,000. Um, and in China, uh, somewhere in between about eight per 100,000. So there's clearly some underlying uh, ethnic, but probably more importantly, environmental exposures that lead to these very diverse uh, risks and in incidents of cholangiocarcinoma. So for example, in Thailand, the incidence of liver fluke is very, very high, especially in northern Thailand, and that's probably what's contributing uh, to the high incidence there. Whereas in the United States, probably one of the biggest risk factors for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is obesity and um, non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver disease. So if you look at the last uh, several decades, um, there has been a dramatic uh, change in the incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma compared to extrahepatic. So we typically think of perihilar, so I mean, you've heard of like Klatskin tumor, like the perihilar tumor as being the most common type of cholangiocarcinoma. But really over the last two, three decades, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma has become much more common. Now, why would that be? And I think this is important to kind of putting on your like critical thinking hat. One of it is just a misclassification bias because 10, 20, 30 years ago, anyone who came into clinic and had a mass in their liver and it was biopsied and it came back adenocarcinoma, many of those patients were classified as adenocarcinoma, not other NOS, not otherwise specified, or unknown primary. We didn't have the sophistication of um, hepatopathologists or the immunohistochemical staining for them to feel comfortable calling it a primary intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So some of the increased incidence is probably just an artifact, a reclassification of patients. That being said, there is evidence that there has been a true uh, increase in the incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma over time, and that's probably uh, due to a number of different environmental factors, and I point out some of these here. As I mentioned, hepatobiliary flukes, largely in eastern countries, and more in western countries, you know, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, and also hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So any type of chronic inflammation of the liver increases your chance not only for primary hepatocellular carcinoma, but also for primary intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And then most likely uh, in Western countries, the epidemic of obesity and associated diabetes, so so-called NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, has led to an increase in the uh, prevalence of um, um, cholangiocarcinoma. And this is a paper that we published now almost seven years ago, um, looking at a normal liver. You can see normal liver here with the normal hepatocytes, and you see the uh, portal triad right here. And then here's a liver filled with fat. You can see all this adipocytes in the liver. And this fatty deposition in the liver creates an oxidative stress to the liver and injures the liver. So we used to think that you had to have a fatty liver and then you got fibrosis and cirrhosis, and then after that you developed either 
primary liver cancer or intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Well, that isn't the case nowadays. As many, many people come in, they have a fatty liver and they have a hepatocellular carcinoma. Or they have a fatty liver and they have an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. That's my most common. As a woman, probably mid-50, stubbed her toe, got the proverbial CT scan, incidental mass in the liver, biopsied, adenocarcinoma, ICC, overweight, fatty liver because the oxidative stress, even in the absence of fibrosis or cirrhosis, leads to a much higher incidence of this uh, disease. So over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, our molecular understanding of this disease has significantly improved. There's a number of different pathways um, that are involved. Um, you know, most of these data are derived from a um, international consortium that um, we put together, I put together over the last now 20 years of about now 20 centers from all around the world, you know, China, Japan, Australia, a bunch of places in Europe, the United States. And we've done a lot of um, um, uh, kind of epidemiologic work using the data, but we've also had the opportunity to take some of the pathologic specimens and do correlates, scientific correlates. So this is an example where we had a lot of the, the paraffin embedded blocks were sent uh, actually to MGH, one of our collaborators in MGH, and he performed um, genetic mutational analysis on the re these respect resected specimens of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And a couple things that um, showed up on this uh, particular study was that at least in the panel that he was using to look at, 62% had no somatic, somatic mutation. And the most common mutations that were identified were KRAS and BRAF, and those aren't surprising because we know that in patients who have GI cancers like pancreatic cancer or colorectal cancer, those are the two most common genetic mutations that we see. But the other two most common uh, mutations were IDH1 and IDH2, which if you combine these were um, mutated in about 20% of patients. And these genetic mutations are important because they have prognostic importance, but also they may be potentially targetable. So these are some data that we published showing that patients who had either a KRAS or a BRAF mutation in the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma had a significantly worse um, survival with the median survival only of about one year after resection, if indeed you had uh, these mutations. This is another paper that was um, published when I was at Hopkins and uh, Nature Genetics where we did whole exome sequencing of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and again identified that this IDH mutation uh, was important and that individuals who had a mutation in IDH had a median survival of only about two or two and a half years. And as I've mentioned, um, these um, defects or mutations are important not only for prognostic purposes, but also they're important because they're potentially uh, targetable. And in particular, this IDH1 mutation is important because there are clinical trials that are open now um, specifically targeting patients um, with IDH1 mutations um, with a molecular uh, therapy. And you can see here, um, you know, whole genome sequencing of cholangiocarcinoma, the different types of genetic mutations that have been identified and, um, again, potentially targetable, in particular immunotherapy with PD-1 and also this uh, FGFR1 uh, receptor. And if we look overall um, at perihilar versus intrahepatic versus gallbladder, you can see that there is some variation with regards to um, IDH1 more commonly being mutated in um, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma compared to other biliary cancers such as perihilar or uh, gallbladder. And again, you can see with this IDH1, the overall survival is um, less. The other thing that we were interested in is looking at if there was any role for immunotherapy in, immu uh, in uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And this is a study that we published specifically looking at uh, PD-1 um, immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors and in seeing if indeed there was an opportunity to treat these patients. And in the subset of patients, you can see at the uh, tumor liver interface that there was significant staining uh, for PD-1, uh, suggesting that there was possible subset of patients who might benefit from um, immunotherapy. And as I've noted, um, I think what's particularly exciting in this field now is that there's a number of clinical trials that are open. Um, here I um, highlight this as a phase two trial that's open for patients who have this IDH1 mutation. There's um, another trial um, that's open 
um, for um, pemerolizumab, um, uh, immunotherapy for patients who have um, microsatellite high um, instability tumors. And then there's also a clinical trial open for patients who have um, 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 uh, targeting of the FGFR um, dysregulation. So in many patients, especially those with inoperable diseases, I frequently refer them to my colleagues in medical oncology so they can get enrolled on a clinical trial. Now, what about the clinical diagnosis of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? As I mentioned with my example of that woman who came to the ER, most of these patients are asymptomatic because this isn't a tumor that's in, at the bile duct, right? So people don't present typically with jaundice because they don't have kind of perihilar or distal obstruction. So they typically present asymptomatically. And because of that, the tumors can get quite large. So most of the time when someone shows up, it is a big tumor because it's peripheral in nature and it has a long time to grow and it's found incidentally. And this is a, you can see here on the axial imaging, the CT, here's a mass involving the right hemi liver, here's the gallbladder here, and here is a coronal cut, and you can see it's in kind of segments five and six. So typically what happens is that when someone sees a mass, I say it's like the Homer Simpson effect, you know, see the donut, eat the donut, or the intern effect, you know, people just biopsy it. They say, see a tumor, they just want to put a needle into it. So I would um, suggest resist, resist biopsying. Um, things in general. Because as a surgeon, I do not need a tissue diagnosis to take someone to the operating room. So kind of paradoxically, I biopsy things more commonly when I think they're inoperable. Because my colleagues in medical oncology, they need a tissue diagnosis. They're not going to give a cytotoxic chemotherapy to someone and they don't know what they're treating. But for me, you know, if, if, there's, if there's a mass in the head of the pancreas, that's not normal, looks resectable, unless I'm planning on giving chemotherapy or something, I'm gonna take that out, right? And that being said, most of these tumors are always biopsy by the time they get to us as surgeons as a secondary or tertiary referral. Now, when you get these biopsies, typically what you'll see is some biliary dysplasia, um, and also they will do immunohistochemical staining. And what we'll look for is for the IHC to be positive for CK7 and also a AE1, AE3 to suggest the presence of biliary epithelium. It's also a diagnosis of exclusion. Since it's adenocarcinoma, we want to rule out other types of adenocarcinoma, such as lung, colon, and pancreas. And these specific markers, when negative, can rule out those as primary sites. Someone um, um, asked me um, earlier about tumor markers, such as CEA, CA19-9, AFP. And in general, tumor markers are not meant to screen for cancers or to diagnose a cancer. And so these tend to be very specific but not very sensitive. So if you have a CA19-9 and it's a thousand, chances are biliary malignancy, right? But if it's 10, you can't rule out that the patient has a biliary malignancy or not. And this is um, somewhat sad, I think, and tragic because you will, I will see about twice a year where someone comes in and they have a large liver cancer infiltrating, maybe it's a little bit subtle on the scan, they have normal AFP and they're being seen by their primary care doctor or whomever and they kept saying, well they kept telling me that the tumor marker was normal. I don't have to worry about tumor markers normal. Tumor markers normal. In 20% of patients their tumor markers will be normal even in the setting of advanced disease. So you cannot hang your hat on these uh, tumor markers. So typically what I tell students is that when a patient comes in, they have an adenocarcinoma in their liver, you need to kind of run the drill, right? And what's the drill? The drill is to make sure that this is not a secondary malignancy. So before you assume it's a primary adenocarcinoma, a primary intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, you need to rule out that this isn't a secondary metastatic lesion from the breast, from the stomach, from the colon. And so you need to make sure that women have had an updated mammogram, gynecologic exam, you know, make sure the patients have had a recent uh, colonoscopy, um, um, and also uh, get cross-sectional imaging, either a CT um, or an MRI. Now it's important to know on um, cross-sectional imaging that there are different morphologic subtypes of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So there's different flavors, if you will. So there's the, morph, there's the mass forming subtype, which you can see here, which by its name forms a mass. 
you can see that it's usually a low attenuation lesion, so it's a little bit darker than the rest of the liver. You see this capsular retraction here, and then you also can see some types, sometimes peripheral enhancement and then central necrosis, especially in large tumors. There's also the periductal infiltrating type, and this is much more subtle, but here's a bile duct, and you can see how it's dilated, and there's enhancement of the bile duct. And then the last type is the introductal growth pattern. You see this ductatasia, so this kind of, you know, um, beads, beading of the bile duct. You can see it here on pathology. The most common type is the mass forming. If you look at the uh, liver cancer study group of Japan, you know, about 80% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma will be the mass forming type. And most of the data around intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma are based on that, um, that, that type of tumor. So again, just to kind of go over some of the findings um, on the cross-sectional imaging, and this is, again, important for the students. So there's certain key words, at least in liver imaging, right? So early enhancement, late washout. That, those are key phrases to make you think that it is a hepatocellular carcinoma because it, it's a very vascular tumor, so when you get the IV injection of the contrast, it early enhances, right? And then if you wait and you get delayed images, that contrast washes out. So typically that's because you have a hard liver, a cirrhotic liver, and the HCC is a soft tumor. It's the opposite for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. You know, as I've mentioned, typically these are patients who have a fatty liver, a fatty liver is very soft, it's very friable. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, though, is a tough, fibrous tumor. So when you get the scan, usually you don't see any enhancement on the early phases. It's late. You have to wait. You have to give, give the contrast a chance to get through that dense stroma. So that's why, again, typically we, I, I don't need a biopsy. If you have a good liver radiologist with CT and MRI, they can almost all the time differentiate an HCC from an ICC. And if you look at this uh, CT scan, you can see uh, here this large mass. It's somewhat hypodense. And then also what you can look for is you see here, these are the bile ducts. You see this peritumoral ductal dilatation. I strongly prefer MRI um, in my practice. You can see here, these are all the kind of sine qua nones, if you will, of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. A large mass, capsular retraction, the early imaging, there's no enhancement, it's dark, it's dense. Later images, look, you start to see this enhancement, see how it's brighter, but yet you see central necrosis of the tumor. And then also you can see around the tumor, this peritumoral ductal dilation. This is this pathognomonic for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, right? We don't need a biopsy, we know that. The other thing is that I tend to use a lot of PET for this disease. You know, PET scan um, is very avid, is a very FDG avid um, tumor. Um, and if you look in the literature, um, if you get PET, it'll help two things. One is it'll help rule out, rule out sometimes an occult primary, right? So if you get the PET and something lights up in the rectum, then I'm like, oh, I'm, maybe there's colon cancer. We missed the rectal cancer. The other thing it can help is that if it lights up the nodal disease, and if you see occult nodal disease on the PET scan, as I'm going to tell you later on, it may change your management. You may think about giving chemotherapy first before operating on the patient, because if it already has spread to the nodal basin, I'm a little bit worried that there could be occult metastatic disease and if I just operate on you right away, we're gonna find out about the occult metastatic disease on your first post-op scan four months from now, and I'd much rather give you the preoperative chemotherapy and figure that out before I put you through an operation that may never help you in the beginning. So surgical resection, so this is our internet, there's a lot more flags now, but it, it takes a long time to find flags on Google, so I've just left it like this, but there's a lot more flags. So this is a case, and Dave, this is a case I was, I was talking about. We were talking about a, a case earlier today of yours. So here's a patient, large mass in the right hemi liver, right? But it's also in the left liver. So here's um, the umbilical fissure. So just to orient you, so this is the principal plane. So what's that called? Does anybody know what that's called in the liver? Whose line? Somebody's line. K 
Cantley's line, right? So Cantley's line is the Cantley line is a gallbladder fossa. It goes straight back to the vena cava. It divides the right liver from the left liver, right? So that's that's not this. This is where the um, umbilical fissure comes, right? So the, the ligamentum teres, that's what goes to your belly button, right? And that's where the umbilical circulation occurs. So this mass is actually in the right and the left liver. This is segment 4B of the liver. This is the right um, posterior branch of the portal vein. There's usually a right anterior branch here, but it's been consumed by the tumor. So this is a tough tumor. It's a tough location because you're going to have to probably do an extended right hepatic resection, take out all the right liver, and then some of the left liver, and only leave this segment here. And there's some vascular involvement. And you also can't appreciate on this scan, but there was some satellite ptosis, David. You know, we talked about that. There was some satellite lesions. So I thought about this patient. I'm like, well, this is a big tumor, tough location, satellite lesions. And... Um, like most surgeons, I, I, I wouldn't show it to you if I didn't take it out, right? No, no surgeon's ever going to show you, like, and then I didn't take it out. No, no. And then, so, um, so, what, so what I did actually, though, is I gave preoperative chemotherapy. I actually gave preoperative interarterial therapy, too. Like, so, you know, catheter base, had an intubational radiologist go, put it, puncture the groin, go up, thread a catheter through the hepatic artery, deliver direct chemotherapy to the liver, waited a while, nothing spread anywhere else. Then I took him to the operating room. So I think being aggressive is appropriate, but being thoughtful is even more appropriate, right? And, and trying to stack, there's nothing wrong with stacking the deck in both your and the patient's fa favor by waiting some time to let the biology declare itself. Because I tell patients, surgery can only help patients with good biology. There's no operation that's gonna help bad biology, right? I'm, I'm not gonna be able to help you. So I wanna figure out the biology, and here we figure out the biology. So then we went in, and just to orient you, we took out all the right liver and the left liver, and this is that umbilical fissure that I showed you. See, that's the round ligament going right to the base of um, segment 2-3. Here's the um, portal vein um, right here, and here's the artery, and then you can see this is where the right portal vein was, which we stapled, okay? And then the whole extra hepatic biliary tree is gone. And so this is the intra- um, um, hepatic biliary tree right at the base of segments two and three. So if that hopefully makes sense to you, all this is gone. This is the piece of liver that you're looking at. The extra hepatic biliary tree is removed, and we're looking at that bile duct right there inside the liver. And then what we do, here's the specimen, all the right liver, here's the gallbladder and block, here's the tumor right here. So, you know, it's a big operation, right, taking out like 80% of somebody's liver. And then the other thing, though, is that these are tough tumors, right? Look, I, I probably, it's still, the margin is still close. So if you look at the data for getting a negative margin for patients who have, like, colorectal liver metastasis, we can do that, like, 90% of the time. But if you look at our international experience here, getting a negative margin, it's more like 75 to 80% of the time. So, like, 20 to 25% of the time, we're leaving a positive margin. Why? because it's a really big tumor, it's a tough operation, they're in difficult locations, and therefore sometimes a positive margin gets left behind. And then um, just to um, tell you how we fix this, so we brought like a RU limb. So I don't know how familiar you are with that, but basically you know, we transected the jejunum and um, swung up um, a limb of the small bowel, and then we did um, a direct hepatico uh, jejunostomy, you know, just with some um, sutures, things like that. So if you look at the type of resection, anatomic versus non-anatomic, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be a difference whether you do a truly anatomic or non-anatomic resection. But what does matter is that you get a negative margin, right? So we really try hard. You can see the survival curves here. The patients who have um, a negative margin, you know, not surprisingly, um, do better than patients who have a positive margin. And this is why I tell patients, you know, no, no, no disrespect to our medical oncologist colleagues, but I say for medical oncology a little bit, I'm being facetious here, so I'm gonna be, be careful. Um, for, for, for chemotherapy, what matters is the recipe. For surgery, what matters is the cook, right? Because it, 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 in, in surgery, getting a negative margin, make, doing a good oncologic operation is very important. And, um, you know, and there is a volume outcomes relationship with some of, of these more complicated operations. And so having someone 
uh, like David, um, who can do a great operation um, and get a negative margin and do an adequate uh, lymph node dissection is uh, super important with regards to long-term um, outcome. Um, sometimes these cases are really complicated with the vascular reconstruction. So if they're involving the portal vein, we'll have to actually resect the portal vein and then reconstruct it. I think the important take home uh, message there is that if you're able to do that or if that is necessary to get that negative margin, you should do it because the long-term survival will be the same. But don't kid yourself, the mortality around the time of the operation will be higher. Even in the best of hands, the 90-day um, operative mortality um, will be higher. And despite all that, and I showed this slide this morning, despite all that, the long-term survival for these patients is still abysmal. The five-year survival is in the range of about 30%, and the true overall probability of curing these patients even after major surgery is still only in the order of about um, 10%. So trying to better identify the prognosis of these patients is kind of the business of staging, right? That's why we stage patients so we can better stratify them with regards to their long-term um, outcomes and also try to figure out who would benefit from perhaps adjuvant therapy or not. So this is one of the things I'm, I'm probably most proud of, of, of my contributions, is around the staging of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So again, when I was a fellow and I was kind of deciding to focus on this, there have been six editions of the AJCC, so the American Joint Committee on Cancer Staging, and this is kind of like the Bible of how everything gets staged, you know, both here in the United States but also worldwide. And if you looked in this book and the previous five editions, there was no staging for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. There was a sentence um, in the chapter on hepatocellular carcinoma that said you should stage intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma the same. And really that made no empiric sense because they're two totally separate diseases. Why would you stage them the same? And the reason was it was a very rare disease and there was no data out there. So they basically just put this sentence in there and said, good luck. Now, there had been two Japanese groups that had proposed distinct staging systems for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but they had never really been um, looked at in the United States. So actually one of my residents at Hopkins at the time, um, we set out to propose a staging system for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and we used both large administrative data sets like SEER. I don't know how familiar with SEER, but SEER is a large data set in the United States. It's based on about like a 15% sample of cancer patients in the United States. And we also had access to like Medicare data. So anyone who gets a bill, you know, sent into Medicare, we have all those data. So we're talking about like hundreds of thousands of records. And then we also had our international data set, you know, um, based on the 20 centers around the world. I think that's another key um, point for me or teaching point is that multiple data sets will allow you to do different things. So with Medicare, there was power in numbers, right? You had hundreds of thousands of records. So there's certain things you could do with that data set that you couldn't do with a data set that only has 500 or 1,000 patients. But in our, inter in our international data set, there was power in granularity, right? We collected very specific data fields that were only available because we were specialized centers and we all knew what data we wanted. We could go back to the record, we could go back to our pathologist, and those data weren't available in Medicare, right? Because that's a claims-based data set. So by overlapping different data sets, we were able to come up with a staging system. And the first thing that we showed is that the two Japanese uh, staging systems really weren't that helpful, right? If you look at how they stratify patients, this is nonsensical. I mean, T1 does worse than T2, it's, you know, that's worthless. And even here you can begin to see maybe there's a stratification of patients, but it still was not statistically significant. So in 2010, we actually proposed a simplified staging system for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And um, this involved um, looking at um, whether the tumor was multifocal, and whether there was um, vascular invasion or whether it was invasion to any contiguous uh, organs such as the colon, gallbladder, diaphragm. And you can see that our proposed um, uh, staging system, incrementally the hazard of death went up as the T category went up, which is what you want. That's the whole purpose of staging. And so actually it was very satisfying that in the seventh edition, 
the AJCC actually adopted this staging system. So in the first, um, um, for the first time ever in the seventh edition, they adopted the work that largely um, Dr. Nathan, my resident, did. And um, one of the chapters in this book um, represents the staging. And then more recently in the eighth edition, we've revised the staging. There's been a lot of work, a lot of subsequent papers. And I think uh, uh, Alex, right, Alex, no, Alex asked me at lunch about, you know, whether we have been continuing to do work, and we have, and we've been refining, refining the staging system over the years. And in the eighth edition, we refined it such that now T1 disease is um, T1A less than five centimeters, T1B greater than five centimeters, T2 is um, patients who have vascular invasion and or multifocal disease, and then um, uh, T4 um, has been eliminated uh, from the staging system. So the first thing to note is that, you know, everything is evolving. Right? So all these staging systems over time just keep changing and changing and changing. And the second thing is you know, that doing this work and kind of having a very clear idea where we wanted to go with our work, you know, I, I feel like we were going to make some type of contribution that now it's in the staging manual. And it's, kind of, it's kind of cool right, that people are using our staging system around the world to stage neuropathic cholangiocarcinoma. So I think it's a very clear example of you know, sticking to something, focusing on something, and then actually being have, have impact and having adopted by the general uh, community. And our staging system has been validated by others multiple, multiple times. Um, and this is just one example of our own validation. Now, the other thing that I was really interested in, and I'm getting really more of a liver geek, is about the nodes, right? So, and the staging, there's the T, right? That's the, you know, the tumor, the depth of invasion of the tumor. Then there's the, that's local. Then N is regional, right? So, like, nodes. Is it, so, the whole concept of lymph nodes for liver cancer is interesting, at least to me. So we do not do a lymphadenectomy for garden variety hepatocellular carcinoma. So if you have a primary liver cancer, I take that out. I don't even worry about the lymph nodes. If you have fibrolamellar, a variant, different variant of hepatocellular carcinoma, we all agree, you gotta do a lymphadenectomy. You gotta do it because 30% of those patients will have lymph node metastases. Gallbladder cancer, lymph nodes, right? But colorectal metastases, we don't. So there's kind of like this, sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. So then we asked, or intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, should we be doing lymph node dissection? And these, these data are a little bit old because now we have over 1,000 patients. But back then, even in major hepatobiliary centers, whether you had a lymphadenectomy or not was a flip of a coin. Half the time, people were doing it. Half the time, people weren't doing it. So even amongst very specialized people, you know, there was no standardization. However, if you look at the patients who had a lymphadenectomy, the incidence of N1 disease having lymph node metastasis was 30%. So not too dissimilar to that fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma I was telling you about, and we do it for that. So why don't we do it for this? Well, you could say, well, Tim, you know, you're cooking the books. You're cooking the books because it was a whole other half of people who were NX. You don't know, right? Well, I'll say, you know what? I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume all of these NX patients are N0, best case scenario. The incidence would still be about 20%. And this has been repeated over and over again. So the incidence of lymph node metastases for patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is somewhere between 20 to 35%. Um, and so why do a lymphadenectomy? Well, we, we should do a lymphadenectomy because that's what we do for other GI can cancers, right? I don't think that doing a lymphadenectomy for colon cancer is providing a therapeutic benefit, right? I do it for staging purposes, right? Um, and maybe I decrease the incidence of like nodal recurrence, but I'm not sure that's really improving their overall survival, but it is important for staging. And so it's similarly important for staging for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma because for those patients who have nodal disease, they do significantly worse um, overall. And the other point that we make is if you are not going to stage the nodal basin, don't even bother staging the patient at all, right? It's not even worth it. Because if you think when we stage patients, it's all about competing risk. It's all about competing risk. And this, this is what these two slides show. So if you're N0, what drives your survival is your T category, 
right? Whether you have vascular invasion or not, whether you have a single lesion or not, right? But if you have N1 disease, right, what drive, what's driving your survival is the fact you have N1 disease, right? So now you see in patients with N1 disease, vascular invasion in single and multiple lose their prognostic power because what has become more important is the fact that you have lymph node metastases. So the whole staging system doesn't even work unless you get the nodal um, information. And so, you know, in thinking about this, you know, typically what I do um, is that I um, do a dissection of um, 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 12 and 13 and then 8. These are the nodal stations that I um, dissect. There is somewhat of a sidedness. This is even like, you know, super geek dome. But if you're on the right side versus the left side, you know, the Japanese have like mapped out. So if you have a tumor on the left side, where the, no, where the your nodal basins that are at higher risk are different than if the tumor is on the left side, right? So you have to kind of change the lymphadenectomy that you do, sometimes based on the location of the uh, tumor. And the other thing is that in um, the most recent uh, staging manual, we really set that you have to have at least six lymph nodes evaluated or the patient isn't adequately staged. Now, if you look, here's some population data that we have published. The um, ability to get since six lymph nodes is, is very low. So if you look at population-based data, that less than half of the time when we do a lymphadenectomy, are we getting six, six lymph nodes out or not? So according to the staging system, you know, we're still grossly understaging patients because we're not getting um, an adequate lymphadenectomy. And that may be because, you know, um, surgeons who are doing this aren't removing the nodes from all these various stations that I'm highlighting. So um, non-surgical therapy. We talked about surgery. You know, and the problem with surgery, as I mentioned, is that outcomes are super poor. You know, five-year survival, 30%. So this is like pancreatic cancer. I mean, thinks pancreatic cancer is like, you know, the worst thing that you could ever hear about. Well, come to find out, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is not far behind. I mean, this is a disease that has a very high fatality rate. And why? Well, not surprisingly, because patients recur. And not only do they recur, they recur often and they recur quickly. So based on um, these data here, you can see that, you know, half of uh, patients will develop a recurrence. And if you look at the median time to recurrence, it's less than two years. So half of patients, after having some big operation like that, will experience a recurrence in less than two years. And half of patients will develop with an extra hepatic site as a component of that recurrence. So systemic disease. So this is systemic disease almost even when you see the patient. And if you look at the risk of recurrence, as I mentioned, overall it's about, you know, 60%. But then if you start tacking on, you know, patients who have multiple lesions or if they have lymph node metastases, it's almost 100%. And that's why, you know, Dave and I were talking earlier on, it's like when you, you see a patient who has multifocal disease, you know, I am not likely to offer that patient resection out of the box, right? I'm going to want to treat that patient with preoperative chemotherapy, drag a little bit, see if the biology declares itself. If you get that PET scan and all those lymph nodes light up in the, in the hilum, you know, mm, maybe you should give preoperative chemotherapy first, let the biology declare itself, then uh, move in. And if you look at where patients recur, you know, a third of patients will recur in the lymph nodes. And I do think this is another reason why you should do the lymphadenectomy, not only for staging purposes, but if you do not do the lymphadenectomy, there is a chance that patients will recur with hilar lymph nodes. And it's a little bit different than when you have a lymph node recurrence like in the mesentery of the colon. If you have bulky nodal recurrence in the hilum of the liver, you can get biliary obstruction, right? And it can be a major kind of quality of life issue for patients or even like duodenal obstruction. You know, kind of retro duodenal adenopathy can be an issue. And actually that just reminds me of a patient that I was just referred um, um, to last week. So that's another reason why they use this lymphadenectomy. And so because the incidence of recurrence is so high, 
you know, we need our college, colleagues in medical oncology, right? Because all the advancements in surgery have largely been, I would argue, been predicated on the backs of the advancements in medical oncology, right? As we expand indications for resection of pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, whatever cancer, it's always because we have better chemotherapy. I remember as a medical student, they told me, don't go into surgery because the chemotherapy is going to get so good, it's going to put you out of business. And it's the exact opposite effect. As chemotherapy has gotten better, we have expanded our in in indications because patients are living longer, right? Because I'm now more likely to operate on that patient because I know I can send them to medical oncology and they can salvage them with chemotherapy and keep them alive. So with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the type of chemotherapy that we should use is, um, is generally um, gem cisplatin. And these are data from the so-called ABC trial, the Advanced Biliary Cancer Trial. And in this trial, these are patients who had advanced disease, not operable disease, advanced disease. And they were randomized to either monotherapy with gemcitabine versus doublet therapy with cisplatin and gemcitabine. And again, to pick on my uh, medical oncology colleagues, you know, this is a great success, great success, a doubling of median survival from four months to eight months. Right, think about that, right? You know, so this is what we're talking about. I mean, like this is like deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, okay, yes, it was a doubling, but still the overall survival in eight months, right? This is not this is this isn't a big win. This isn't a big win. But based on these data in kind of the advanced setting, it was extrapolated kind of into the adjuvant setting. So most patients would get gem cis. Now more recently, there have been several prospective studies that have specifically looked at patients in the adjuvant setting. So unlike the ABC, which was advanced disease, there has been the Bill Cap study and the Protege 12 study that looked at patients who had resected cholangiocarcinoma, and should you treat those patients with chemotherapy, or should you just follow them? And these data are interesting, because in the Bill Cap study, patients were randomized after surgery to either get surveillance and or take a pill, Zolota. Which is or capsidabine, which is essentially Zolota, like a 5-FU um, derivative, and um, you know what they found was that the patients who got capsidabine had a much better survival, 51 months versus 36 months, and a 25% chance lower lower chance of death. You know, I, I, frankly, I was su surprised about that you'd see such an effect um, based on uh, capsidabine um, alone. But what made it even more interesting is that around the same time the Protege 12 trial came out, and this was a little bit different. This was Gemox, so gemcitabine plus oxaloplatin. And this was, again, the adjuvant setting after resection. And this was a negative trial. They said there was no benefit, that, that you know, patients who got Gemox versus surveillance, the results were the same, and didn't recommend adjuvant therapy. So how do you justify this one trial that was positive, if you will, with capsidabine, and then this other trial that was negative with Gemox. Well, it's always uh, difficult and inappropriate to compare two different trials, but I'm gonna do it anyways. So some of it is, I think, that in the Protege 12 trial, that if you look, the majority of the patients had no negative disease and had an R0 resection, right? So they had better prognostic factors. But if you look in the Bill Cap trial, there was a much higher incidence of node positive disease and R1 disease. So I think the difference can be attributed, I would say, to two things. And I, I mentioned this earlier today. One is just from a purely statistical point of view. You need to have, un, you need to have events, right? So even if you have a data set that has a million patients but your event of interest is recurrence and only two people get recurrence, no matter what you're studying, you're never gonna see it because there weren't enough events, right? So people are gonna have events when they have worse biology, right? More people are gonna recur if they have worse biology. So some of this may be that the GEMOX study, there was a difference, right? But um, you, you can almost see that maybe there's a trend here, but it was just underpowered, right? If they had bigger sample size, and you know, they had you know, more events, let's say, that they would have detected a difference. It may have been a subtle difference, but they would have detected a difference. The other thing is perhaps the patients who benefit from adjuvant therapy are those who have worse biology, right? So N1 disease or one disease. 
So at least in my practice, everyone who I resect for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, regardless if they're R1, R0, N0, N1, I send them all to medical oncology. Um, because the other thing I've learned um, is that when they do recur, they're going to come back and they're going to be upset. They're going to be upset that you never had a conversation with them about adjuvant therapy. Um, and in their minds, some of them will think, if only I'd gotten chemotherapy, I wouldn't have recurred. And then they're kind of mad at you. I mean, that's just reality. So I, because I, I, the incidence of recurrence is so high, I say, I don't know if you need chemotherapy or not. We should talk about it. And you should also go talk to medical oncology about it. And let's make a decision. Because that way, when, if they recur or not, they feel like that conversation was had right? And then we all, we all kind of like live with it. Radiotherapy, I don't think there's really a rule for radiotherapy. Perhaps if there was like a focal margin that was positive. But in reality, um, you know, for those of us who did liver surgery, when you cut the liver, when you're done, there is a huge surface area, right? So I don't know what the um, right analogy would be, but it may be like if you had like um, um, some type of like silly putty or something. It's a ball. When you step on it, 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 it flattens out. But when, after you cut the liver, the surface area is ginormous. So to actually go back and to figure out where the positive margin is along this big, long cut surface, very hard to figure out. Very, so like putting clips or something and thinking that you're going to have them target that, it's usually n not going to happen. You know, maybe sometimes. You know, you really as a surgeon have to figure out a priori, what's my best resection margin so I can get a negative margin. I think there perhaps is a role for like conformal beam or SBRT, stereotactic beam radiation for patients who have unresectable disease uh, in the liver, but largely that's done um, on trial. And then as I mentioned with my other patient, I do think there's a role for uh, interhepatic therapy, so catheter-based therapy. And so this is unlikely to cure patients, right? But what usually is their proximate cause of death is liver progression. So if they have liver progression of their disease, they'll go into liver failure, they'll have biliary obstruction. It's just not, it's a, it's not a great way to die. So if you can get control or retard the progress of disease in the liver, perhaps you can't cure them, but you may prolong their life. So sometimes what I have done in unresectable situations is that we will treat them with systemic chemotherapy, right, to make sure they don't blossom extra hepatic disease, because if they do, there's no role to target the liver if they have a bunch of lung mats, right? But if they don't have extra hepatic disease and their liver remains inoperable, then doing some type of catheter-based therapy, and there's actually some robust data out of Memorial Stone Kettering Cancer Center of even putting in pumps, so a pump is when you put in something like a hockey puck that has like a catheter coming out of it and you surgically place that catheter directly into the hepatic artery and then the hockey puck pump, if you will, sits in the subcutaneous tissue and then you can percutaneously through the skin load that pump up and then it will directly administer chemotherapy into the liver. You can have some pretty dramatic responses. And so I think doing targeted intrahepatic therapy for this disease definitely, in my mind, has a, has a role for those patients who don't have um, a large uh, burden of extrahepatic disease. So um, I'm going to kind of conclude there. Um, hopefully what I've demonstrated to you, first of all, is like pick something that you're passionate about. And for me, it was, I was passionate about liver disease, passionate about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I think, if possible, maybe try to identify something that you, you see a gap. And we were talking to the PH students at, you know, at lunch, you know, I think like any grant you write, right, the first thing they want to know is like, what's the gap, right? What are you trying to answer? You know, this has already been answered. Nobody cares, right? So for me, I was like, I looked at the AGCC manual. I said, there's a gap. There's like this one sentence on, in this chapter that says, you know, stages cancel like, the, the, like everything else. It didn't make sense to me. And then so there was a clear way that I thought that I can move forward. Um, you know, try... Um, to be collaborative, especially in rare diseases. I always say, why do it alone when you can do it with friends? And I think, you know, the, the power of collaboration um, is, is amazing. And, and frankly, I think it's the best thing in academic surgery and academic medicine is the friends and collaborators that you can, you know, build not only here in the United States, but across the entire world. And 
you know, it, it's, it's kind of fun in academic surgery to have all these friends, all these places, and to be able to collaborate and learn from them. Um, and then I think be very purposeful um, in, you know, what you want to attack and kind of come at it different ways. You know, come at it with different databases, or now we're getting, you know, the tissue specimens. We're also trying to leverage some other things now to do some more molecular analyses. Um, and then, you know, even more recently, try to come up with some ways that we can collaborate as a group to do some trials, right? Some clinical trials that we're trying to open. So, you know, it's a tough disease. Um, I think that really only a multidisciplinary approach um, offers any hope for these patients with good surgery, good multidisciplinary care, the integration of systemic chemotherapy. And really, I think, um, you know, this setting is a perfect setting because we're going to need the kind of interaction between MDs and PhDs to really um, identify, you know, novel molecular targets, right? We need to work together. Um, and I think this is a perfect disease that epitomizes that, right? Unless we work together and have further scientific discovery around the molecular underpinnings and really understanding what can be targeted and how can we make this much more personal for these patients, are we really going to have uh, any progress, which was um, for an otherwise um, extremely uh, fatal uh, disease. So um, with that, I'll, I'll conclude with uh, Go Bucks and um, also um, another thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you all today and I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions. Well, I think, um, so I think a couple things. One is good preoperative planning, right? So, you know, having good imaging and um, also making sure that you, you um, yourself feel very comfortable. Um, you know, I, I look at the radiology report, but barely, if, you know what I mean? So I think over time, right, you have to be very fast all looking at the scans and also um, having a good operative approach. Like, I have a mental image about how I'm going to enter an operation before I go into that operating room, right? I'm, I'm playing it out, thinking about it in 3D way. You know, some cases are obviously more challenging than other cases. So I think that's the first part. I think the second part is experience in the operating room, um, being very good with interoperative ultrasound, which is a key thing for liver surgeons, um, to be able to be very good ultrasonographer in the operating room, to plan your plan parenchymal transection margin, I think is important. And then also, um, you know, just experience even when you're coming through the liver. It's amazing how easily even, even experienced liver surgeons can get off track. You know, you can come ten tangentially, you can get much closer to the tumor than you think. You have to constantly be looking at it with the ultrasound, again, kind of incrementally. And then also having good judgment um, because, you know, some cases you have to balance between going for more and then what are the implications of that, right? So example, I did a Whipple the other week and, um, you know, the neck margin, and I, I called, they called down, they said, oh, the neck margin looks like it's positive. So you have to make a decision, like how far am I going to chase the, you know, the, when you cut the pancreas, how far am I going to chase that to get a negative margin? Kind of knowing, you know, a millimeter at the disease at the pancreatic neck margin, is that really going to drive this patient's survival with pancreatic cancer? Maybe yes, maybe no. So I said to myself in that case, said, uh, we're going to take one more cut of the neck, and if it's positive, well, you know, that's, I, I feel bad about it, but we're going to do the anastomosis because otherwise the duct is going to be too small and they're going to have a PJ leak. And then, so of course, we, we took another neck, and then they called back and said, oh, no, that was just fibrosis. The first one wasn't positive anyways. You know, I was like, okay. So I think, you know, all those things kind of go into it, if that makes sense, yeah. Mm. But you just wasn't the classical history that multifocal disease is M1. You have satellite nodules throughout the liver. Yeah, so I think satellite ptosis is different than intrahepatic metastases, right? So, you know, we were talking about this a little bit too. So, you know, I think it's, 
you know, multifocality is very different, right? So I think there's the having an index lesion and then having satellitosis, right? Then even in my mind, there's multifocality even within the same segment or the same heavy hemiliver then is different than true multifocality on, on both, both sides. So we have actually published, you know, looking at resection of multifocal disease. And I think there is a role for resecting patients with multifocal disease. But again, I would heavily pre-treat those patients before I would do it. And in general, I'm talking about operating on someone um, who, who either has an index lesion with some satellitosis and or someone who probably has two, maybe three lesions. But other than that, you know, those patients are likely not going to get resected. Any other questions? Yeah, David. I want to thank you so much for the book lectures that you're bringing Morning Watch here. And this is, this, this, this content is just, just both been excellent. And I know those of us who have a chance to, to see to your book. I'm hoping you can help me address an issue I struggle with. Um, and, and it has to do with these patients who come in who are potentially resectable with a trisegmentectomy, essentially taking away 80% of the liver and leaving 20%. And these are people who. Um, they don't have cirrhosis, but they have probably a significant amount of fatty liver disease where you start to get uncomfortable with just 20% FLR, functional liver, liver and that, to everybody, that's, that's how much uh, liver you need to, 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 to uh, leave behind so that the patient can actually continue to function. And I've, I've, I've tried to use transarterial tumor embolization or TAPE or TEAR which are, which are the intra-arterial therapy, but I, I labor so, so much because I also need to constrict, I also need to do portal vein, vein embolization in order to grow that other part of the liver that I'm gonna keep behind. So, so I'm sacrificing the venous blood, and then I'm also compromising the arterial blood to what I'm gonna resect. So, so I'm leaving this patient a, a whole segment of liver without adequate blood, increased risk of, risk of abscess and, and situations like that. How do you go about doing that? I assume the example that you had earlier, you didn't have to do a uh, portal vein embolization, you were able to take that out. But in, in a situation where you feel you have to do portal vein embolization, you lose that tool, that arterial therapy, no? So a couple things. So one is, um, so just for the students, so, you know, liver regenerates, right? So I always tell patients um, the liver is not like a starfish. So patients think like the liver is like a starfish. You rip off an arm, the arm is going to grow back, right? I tell patients liver is like a starfish. You rip off the arm, all the other arms get bigger to compensate for the arm that's missing. So it's not true regeneration. It doesn't recapitulate embryonic anatomy, right? The, the liver hypertrophies. So um, what we're talking about is that in patients who you calculate that I'm gonna take out 80% of the liver, I'm only gonna leave them with 20. That's kind of getting down to the area where you could go into liver insufficiency or liver failure. And so is there a means by which we could have their liver grow before the operation rather than after the operation, right? So it's like a stress test for the liver. And come to find out there is. And what we typically do is that we embolize, we occlude the portal flow to the side of the liver that is harboring the tumor. And by shunting all of the portal flow through the future liver remnant, it causes that side of the liver to grow. And it's very quick. It happens within a matter of weeks, like four to six weeks. So you can take a patient and you say, I'm sorry, unresectable. I can't resect you because if I took out this, you'd have too small a liver, you'd have liver failure. You do portal embolization, it grows. You say, now, now you're resectable. So it's a very handy tool. The concern that um, David's highlighting is that if you do both arterial and portal vein, can you do that? The answer is yes. We've actually written on it. We have paper on it. So you know, it, it, you can stage it. You're not going to cause that liver to become completely uh, ischemic. So I think the two options in my mind are either using tear, so using Y90, and then if you wait long enough, sometimes as you know, you'll kind of get like a radio hepatectomy that if you radioembolize like the right liver, that that will this over time atrophy and cause compensatory hypertrophy on the other side. Um, if you're gonna use more taste or bland embolization, you can still do portal vein embolization and the incidence of abscess or you know, infarction is not any higher 
um, and we, we've polished on that. So I, I, we do it staged. We don't do it at the same time, so they don't do both at the same time. So typically we do the taste first, and then we go back and have them do the um, PV. Typically, what, about a month later? Yeah, about four weeks later. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, and it even came up, you know, I was telling someone else we're writing some paper now, but you know, you can do statistical modeling, right? So it, it, it's a little bit different. So when you only have 16 centers, it's hard to factor that in, but when you use like Medicare, right? And there's like hundreds of centers, you can use like what's called fixed effects or mixed effects and, and actually control for the center. So put the center in as a variable that you are controlling for, right? Um, so you can do statistical ways to control for center effects. When you have smaller studies and you only have 15 centers, you can't do that. So then we tend to just do more stratified analyses. Because you're right, so like the basic example is like length of stay. Right, length of stay in China and Japan is way longer, just culturally, right? Because people just don't go home as fast. Like here we want to get people out of the hospital, right? And so, you know, uh, median length of stay for a Whipple is like seven days. Median length of stay for like a Whipple in China is like three weeks because you just hang out, just culturally it's different. So you can't compare those two. So we just tend to do like stratified analyses and say, you know, look, you know, in, in this subset and that subset. And then just be very transparent with the data, report all those things, let people make their own you know, judgments. Um, that frequently comes up with these, um, any papers that we write with this data set. People want to know differences between the East and the West and, and things like that. So it's a good, good question. Yeah. So you talked a lot about, a lot about surgical, surgical resection. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you'd be willing to speculate on how um, some of the, the tumor ablation techniques, like focused ultrasound, irreversible yeah. exploration, that, um, Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, ablative techniques, using, either using like high frequency ultrasound or IRE, irreversible electro, uh, electroporation, or thermal energy, either with ablation or typically most of us now use microwave, um, is, is used. Um, one needs to remember, however, though, that that is also a local therapy. So the indications, I think, are relatively few. Um, because if it's truly local and it's small, because in, for most ablative techniques, there's a size issue, right? Once it gets too big, you just can't create that zone that's big enough. We're just going to resect those patients, right? Um, and so mostly, at least in my hands, um, ablative technique come to patients who have very poor performance status, who can't tolerate an operation, and then you would take them to the operating room or more likely take them to the interventional radiology suite and percutaneously ablate those lesions. Um, I think also for patients who maybe have like oligo uh, disease, you know, um, so if they have like three lesions, you might like resect two and ablate one. It also depends on the location. So sometimes patients have like lesions up by the hepatic veins and you, you can't really resect all of the hepatic veins. So that would be a patient you might think about ablating um, with like microwave and or if there was like a tumor down by the hilum, like right where the bile duct comes in, it's very centrally located, that might be a case where you'd use IRE, electroporation, uh, because that's more um, tolerant of the bile ducts because you can't cook the bile ducts, you'll basically create strictures. Um, so I think it has a role, but not, in, not a huge role, I would say, yeah.
very, I know very little about this, but it seems like a lot of times you don't go back in, or surgeons in general don't go back in. If the mortality is, is so high, what drives that risk assessment of, oh, it's a positive margin, but you can't open it back up, even if they're still in the state you're in? Yeah, so, um, so you usually would know about it in the operating room, because we would usually send a, a frozen it would be uncommon, I can't really think of, that like someone would get to like the pack you or like, the recovery and then like suddenly like, oh, it's a positive margin. Like you would know in the operating room typically, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because you, you, you're getting a frozen and or you just know like, this is the best I can do, I'm gonna take this positive margin. But I will tell you there are patients that like after like a Whipple, like a week later when the path comes back, the margin's positive. Right. But then you, I always think like, you know, I operate on patients for many reasons, but largely two reasons. I think I can improve their quality of life. I think I can prolong their life, right? And if I can't do either one of those things, probably shouldn't be operating, right? So I, then I have to ask myself, if someone has like microscopic disease, again, getting back to my earlier point, at the pancreatic neck after a Whipple, um, you know, I can't help their quality of life. And going back and taking that microscopic disease out is probably not going to prolong their life. And so the risk benefit is just, you know what I mean? It's just not worth it. But we do frequently go back. I mean, especially for colorectal liver metastases. I mean, that's the whole mantra now is that we try to do what, you know, spare as much hepatic parenchyma as possible, right? So we try to take negative margins, but minimal margins. Because when I'm doing my first liver resection, I'm already thinking about, I want to be back here the next time and the next time. Because for some cancers, not like this cancer because it's so aggressive, but for colorectal, because we have good chemotherapy, we're turning into a chronic disease. So there are some patients who have colorectal liver metastases. There's one gentleman, I've done six separate liver operations on him over a course of like seven years. You know, he just keeps coming back, we whittle away, you know, there's more chemo. But he's alive, but he's with disease. So... I think every disease is a little bit different. Um, and then getting to my lecture this morning, I think some of it also depends on like who you see as a surgeon, you know, and what their kind of philosophy is, what their tolerance for risk is, and things like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it comes with experience, comes with training, and I, I think some of it also is just like, you know, what type of what type of glasses do you see the world through, right? You know, some some people, like we were talking this morning, that was my whole call this uh, talk this morning about like how much regret do you have in life? You know, some people really live their life regretting that they didn't do things. Other people live their life regretting that they, you know, had done things, you know what I mean? And so each of us are different and my assessment of risk and is different than David's assessment of risk. And so that's where you get doctor shopping and you'll always find a surgeon and if you want something, if you want an operation, you'll always find someone, almost always find someone to do the operation, right? If you look long enough. <laughs>